Hello everyone and welcome to this very special event, which is simultaneously a curtain raiser for the 2021 Berwick Literary Festival and a pre-launch of Berwick-based poet Anne Ryland's new collection, Unruled Journal. I'm Colin Fleetwood, I'm a member of the Festival Steering Group and it's my great pleasure to be introducing this event. Because we're presenting the event on Zoom webinar, it's not possible for you to see who else is in the audience this evening. But Tan and I have a list on the screen in front of us. And actually I've been watching the, uh, the list grow over the last 15 minutes. It's been lovely to see lots of names of people who I recognize, uh, certainly poets names who I recognize, but also other people and uh, some, some I don't. So uh, whoever you are, you're very welcome to this evening's event. I can tell you all that we've got a lovely audience of poets, as I've already mentioned, festival patrons. Uh, there are some of Anne's students whose names I've just noticed on the list. And I know that many of Anne's family and friends are also with us this evening. Um, and actually, um, I couldn't see this on the screen this evening, but uh, I was looking at the registration list earlier on. We've also got uh, a very uh, cosmopolitan audience from some very exotic places. Uh, we have uh, audience members from Taunton, Carnoustie, Leoncee, Dunleary, and that's just to mention a few. So welcome to everybody. I just want to mention a couple of practicalities before we get going. Chat has now been turned off. Uh, I noticed one or two people joining in the chat um, uh, as, as you were you were joining the uh, webinar this evening. Um, we will be switching it back on again at the end of the event. So if you fancy hanging around for 10 or 15 minutes once the, the formal event has uh, finished, then you will be able to have a chat uh, that will be back on again. Can I also draw your attention to the Q&A button on your screen? Uh, if you can't see it, it has a habit in Zoom, like many things, of disappearing. And uh, uh, But if you wiggle your mouse around, it should appear. If you have any questions for Anne, you can type them in at any time, and we'll try to include as many as possible when we get to the Q&A session. Which brings me to the programme for this evening. Anne will give two readings of approximately 15 minutes, separated by a short informal interview with Jackie Keynes Lang. We'll then have audience questions and festival chair Michael Gallico will conclude proceedings with a taster of what's to come in this year's Berwick Literary Festival, which is only a couple of weeks away now, two or three weeks away. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our special guest, Anne Ryland. Anne grew up in Essex and spent her student years living in Bristol, Leeds and Bonn. The pull of the North, however, was irresistible, which I can understand. Anne moved from London to England's most northerly town, Berwick-upon-Tweed, where she has now lived for over 20 years. Initially, Anne worked in community education as an adult literacy tutor and coordinator. She's now a freelance tutor of creative writing, leading workshops in community-based settings in Northumberland and the Scottish borders. Anne is an advocate of the therapeutic and transformative power of poetry. And she has designed an innovative writing for wellbeing program, the first project of its kind in Berwickshire. Anne also admits to being an unhurried member of Tweed Striders Running Club. Having attended many of Anne's writing workshops, I'm very qualified to tell you that she's an ex excellent teacher and I know there are other students of hers in the audience this evening who will be nodding in agreement with that. Anne's first collection, Automologist, was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best First Collection 2006. The poet Meniza Alvey said of this collection, Anne's poems are unique in their combination of patient exploration and imaginative reach. I'm pleased to say that we have the poet Linda France in the audience tonight. Linda says of Anne's second collection, The Unmothering Class, these poems are shapeshifters, animated narratives of ordinary lives made extraordinary by the poet's precision. 
The Unmothering class was also selected as a New Writing North Read Regional title. Many of Anne's poems have won prizes in competitions and they are widely published in literary journals and anthologies. She received a Northern Promise Award from New Writing North and a distinction in Newcastle University's MA in Writing Poetry. According to the poet Pascal Petit, Anne has a deliciously mercurial imagination and is in love with language. And her poems are so hauntingly meditative they make you shiver. Anne's new collection, Unruled Journal, is published by Valley Press tomorrow, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Anne read a selection of poems from it this evening. Please, can you give a warm welcome to poet Anne Ryland, and I'm pleased to see she's here on screen. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, many thanks, Colin, for those kind words of introduction. Before I read, I'd just like to express some important thank yous. Um, I'm very grateful indeed to the Berwick Literary Festival for hosting and organising this event. Special thanks to the, to the wonderful team who've worked so hard behind the scenes, especially Michael, Colin, Kevin and Jackie. I'm so very proud to be part of this flourishing literary festival. Thank you also um, to my immensely committed team at Valley Press, my publishers, for their expertise. Um, Jamie McGarry, the publisher of Valley Press and his team, especially Joe, Peter and Fran. You've all been a huge pleasure to work with. I'd also like to convey my thanks to the artist Jill Knight, whose haunting painting appears on the cover. I've been extremely fortunate to have you know, such tremendous support from all my friends. There are two numerous to mention, but um, you, you, you know who you are. And among you are some fantastic poets who you've inspired me with your own poetry and you've shown incredible generosity of spirit over the years. So thank you very much. Thank you also to my family for ongoing encouragement. And above all, I want to thank my husband, David, um, who's accompanied me and supported me on every stage of this journey towards the book and has never once shown any sign of weariness. And last but not least, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming along tonight. I can't see your faces, but I, 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 I've seen your names and it, just knowing you're there means a lot to me. Thank you very much. I'm going to read a selection of poems roughly in order in order in which they appear in the book because there is a kind of trajectory. The first poem I owe to a photograph I saw of a skeleton and I was just awed by the magnificent and intricate architecture of the human body. And this skeleton was sitting on a bench just looking incredibly relaxed. And I decided that she was called Agnes. Near where I live, on the road that leads down to the pier, there are some benches overlooking the River Tweed, and I thought if I could sit anywhere with Agnes, it would be on one of those benches. And perhaps some of her serenity would, would rub off on me. This poem is a prose poem. Now, prose poems lack a precise definition, but loosely explained. They bear certain features of poetry, such as precision of language and imagery um, and the music of sounds but a prose poem appears in sentences rather than lines. And I suppose you could regard it as a kind of miniature story, perhaps. One word I'd like to mention in advance, because I'm very conscious many of you live further afield from this region, is the word ha, and the ha is the sea mist or fog, and especially on the east coast of um, England and Scotland. Now, I thought that it would be helpful if we showed this poem on the screen so that you can read along. in her bones. I discover her just off Pier Road, sitting on the bench that overlooks the river. Draped on the wooden slats, right femur resting on left, Agnes is completely at home in her 206 bones. Relieved of padding and muscle of her woman paraphernalia, I note the handbag ears have dragged her right clavicle down. Her hinges and locks are exposed, her irregularities, I lower myself onto the bench beside her. We share small hands and feet, but Agnes is now pure vertebrate. I see her spine's ability to spring, absorb shock. Her pelvis has acquired a creamish luster, a cradle opening to receive sunlight. 
but it would be impolite to place my palm in her ilium. Instead, I shift a little closer to inspect the jigsaw pieces of her skull. She carries on staring out towards the North Sea, an expression of, ah, oh, behind her orbits. Might a bird seek refuge in her ribcage? Agnes has no need of breath. The wind is her breath, passing through her bars, her lacunae, as if she were an instrument being tuned. Despite her loosened appearance, Agnes is incurably informative. She embodies the Greek word pneuma, meaning that which is breathed or blown. She is reluctant to disperse or lie down. I'm unsure whether she's a companion or a proxy who's been hiding in one of my recesses. For now, she settles into tide watch. I will wait. Agnes, at her most osseous, must have a voice. Chalky, no, airy, like the voice of a harp. As Colin said, we moved up here from London over 20 years ago, and I, I felt a complete sense of belonging in this community surprisingly quickly. But about nine years ago, our family had a very turbulent year, and there was the illness and subsequent deaths of two family members, um, one of whom was my father. And I found myself traveling from, well, between here, Northumberland and Essex, where I was born and brought up for many months. And then of course, there were the funerals and there were two house clearances. I was just so relieved to come back to Northumberland, but I struggled to settle for a while. Um, again, a few words I'd like to mention in advance. Um, there are a few words here from Northeastern Scots dialect. Uh, the word, the verb to swither means to dither and to nither is to shiver or huddle with cold. And I just love the sounds of those words. There's also a reference to Duddo Stone Circle near Berwick. And these are five standing stones and they're known locally by names such as the women or the singing stones. Um, according to legend, when the wind blows in a certain direction, because of the grooves in the stones, they make a strange whistling sound. After a spell in Essex. That summer, I came back to the end of England, my southern roots trailing behind. Northumberland brooded, interrogated me. How exactly would I contribute to its flintiness, its neither norness? Unable to blether my way through, I roamed the claggy tracks where lost peel towers guarded their secrets. Marum grasses were no longer praying in the wind. They were running away. The sea didn't call me. The rain warped my doors and my inner walls ached as if a treasure I never knew I'd harboured had been removed. My fault for not shedding my birth county. This land was in no rush. It swithered till at shutter closing time in November, I sensed a faint crumbling and wrote a friendly letter to the stone women of Duddo who'd been singing for 4,000 winters, professed myself Northumberland's hinny, though I still hadn't fathomed. Was a home on the border, a torment, a remedy? I waited and I nithered. <clears throat> My father um, was very ill in an Essex hospital and he'd reached the stage where he was impatient to depart. I wrote this poem at the time, but I, I knew it wasn't really working. I knew it was an important poem, but it wasn't working. So I just put it away. And then I resurrected it a few years ago and suddenly I was able to diagnose the problem. Um, a poet for whom I have huge respect once said to me in relation to another poem, a poet can intrude in her own poem. And yes, there was an intruder and it was me. I took myself out and then I realized that the poem is in fact a duet um, between my father and the tea lady. And on his patient record, the only word written there, the only word recorded was declined. But this lady, the tea lady, she was undaunted by that refrain. And I suppose the poem is a tribute to her, an unsung heroine. The 
the tea lady on Stanbridge Ward. Her correct title is Hostess, Male Surgical Ward. She's an apple green tabard, a clattery trolley. First, she addresses him as Sir, then Mr. Wright, then Kenneth. Both of them are Cockney exiles. She offers the full repertoire, tea, coffee, or she'll nip to the kitchen. Horlicks, hot milk. No, thank you. No. Leave me alone. His refusal is deteriorate. A spat from the gut snarl. Day 10 in the land called Low Spirits. Want a cuppa, darling? When my father places an order, a tea please, not too hot, well sugared. Her face blossoms as if she's replying in song. For this man who longs to snuff it, whose stream of rusty grief can't be purified, the angel of East Ham lifts her giant teapot, arranges a beaker on his tray. The flavor of love, trundled bed to bed, steeped and sweetened, poured into baby cups, sipped through broken lips. Not too hot, wails my father. Oh, Ken, she winks. I can't stand round here and blow on it for you. An amazing woman. As a student, I spent a year studying in what was then West Germany, um, in Bonn, then the capital city. And I had a most wonderful landlady and she had been a DP. And that's the official term for a displaced, or that was the official term for a displaced person um, and a, a refugee. And towards the end of the war, as a very young girl, she'd been one of the millions um, who'd fled or were expelled from the territories that no longer belonged to Germany. She barely spoke of that trauma, of that perilous trek. This poem is in the form of a prayer. It's, it's not about her because I always feel her silence told its own story, but it is for her and for others like her. For a displaced person. Let her be wintered no more. Let her shelter in abandoned chapels, prayer book remnants, her blanket. Let her boots remain steadfast her footprints never alone in snow, until a Spartan but sturdy village gathers her in its apron. Spare her door hammerings. Let her rest a while in a calm room, illuminated by leaves. Let her slowly resettle in the territories of her body. She will need steam and a wafer of soap. I'll furnish her with a pillow goose down, irrefutably white. Let her maplessness disperse. Let a land emerge, not as far from happiness as she imagined. A land where she will be allowed to hold, a house, even a garden, in her palm. Let her be home, over and over. In this collection, there are eight versions of poems by the German poet Hilda Domin, and they're, sort of, they're interwoven with my own poems. There's an ongoing debate in the poetry world um, about the difference between translation and version, and there has been a blurring of terms, I think, in recent years. I suppose a version gives a writer a bit more creative leeway. What I wanted to do was to create new poems in English that stand as poems in their own right, rather than just being correct translations. And I've tried to honour and remain faithful to the tone, the mood of the original German poems, and to convey their distinctive qualities. For example, direct, unsentimental language, simplicity, spareness. Collectively, I've described the poems in the book as, a, as versions, but in fact, a few are, are somewhat closer to translations. I should say a little bit about Hilda Domin. Uh, she was born in 1909 um, and she died in 2006. She was born in Cologne of Jewish parentage, and she left her homeland in 1932 to escape rising anti-Semitism. 
and eventually she settled in the Dominican Republic. But the awakening of her very distinctive poetic voice was really closely connected with her return to Germany, and that was in 1954. And then she started to explore the themes of home and exile, belonging, displacement. And she adopted the nom de plume Domin as a tribute to the country where she found refuge. Her poems are still resonant. I think they have a timeless quality. Um, and in this poem, the central image is a boat, which of course is still a universal symbol of exile. So this is my version of Hilda Domin's poem. And I'm just going to read the last poem now in this first part of the reading. This poem was inspired by a desk that I bought in Edinburgh. And what attracted me most to this desk was a brass plaque, which reads, presented to Mr. John Miller, MA, by the people of Lagan, in appreciation of his invaluable services to the parish, 20th of November, 1908. Well, that plaque clinched it. That, that inscription alone evoked Mr. Miller and suggested a, a particular character, um, a man perhaps who might hide behind his desk, quite elusive. And in the book, there, there is an example of his predictably illegible and elusive handwriting. So this poem I'm going to read is the first in a sequence and the sequence is called Mr. Miller's Desk. And what happens is the desk evolves from being a piece of furniture um, into almost a muse and a kind of communion develops between the desk's original owner and the new female owner. And there's a strange intimacy, I think, of sitting at someone else's desk. I mean, do their words and thoughts somehow filter into us? The poem is addressed to Mr. Miller as a letter. Um, just a couple of place names I, I ought to mention again, because I'm conscious there are people further afield. Lagham is a village in the Scottish Highlands, and Kirkcaldy, uh, my mother's birthplace, is a town on the east coast of Scotland. Dark oak and red leather, January 2015. From a queue of others, your desk called me. That was no request, that was seduction, and you, a village elder. This dark oak with its inkling of prayer needs neither drama nor ornament, steadfast as a pew. Weary legs can pause here. You will censure me for covetousness, I confess, I was struck by a thirst for the gilt tooled writing surface. A rose hip red, unexpectedly medicinal, an autumn red to resist northern winters, as red as the romance of post. Travelling along blue black rivulets in the leather soothes the girl who is with me still. My mother, Mr. Miller, was antiqueless and would have dismissed your desk as second hand, fretted about wartime woodworm burrowing into Essex, into her new home. Born in Kirkcaldy, she might have been softened by the origin, a man from the Highlands with an MA and an inlaid brass plaque. Though troubled by ripe finesse up in Lagan, I am honored to be the desk's owner. So for once, I will remain silent. Thank you, dear Mr. Miller. When your desk claimed its place, it became the room. I have crossed its threshold. Thank you for listening. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Honestly, I mean, that was quite a tour de force. And I'm just reminded what a privilege it is to hear your take on some of your poems and and get that little they all stand alone of course as on, in their own right but just to hear your stories behind them it's such a joy and wonder so my name's Jackie Keynes Lang and I'll be chatting to Anne in just a moment I want she's just gathered herself had a sip of water and uh, I just wanted to say what, what a, a brilliant privilege it is to be part of this wonderful celebration of Anne and her work and to help launch Unruled Journal. What a beauty, it is beautiful. 
and it's published as uh, people have said by value press and uh, wonderful to launch it into the world that there are so many things that i personally love about anne's poetry i mean uh, your startling ability and to juxtapose the ordinary with the surreal and your obvious joy in language and its anomalies and dialects um you have such a light touch with um melancholy and profound emotion it, it it's brilliant um i think colin gave a quote from um the poet monita Al alvi earlier and she says of Anne's new collection on raw journal uh it, it's deeply rewarding far-reaching and humane and i think we can all agree with that from already from the poems that Anne selected to read now, I'm very happy to say that Anne will read more poems from Unruled Journal after this short conversation. And to remind you to put any questions that you might have for Anne into the Q&A function, please. And we will do our best to address those uh, after the second uh, part of this uh, lovely launch event. Now, Anne, as we've already said, your love of language, your ability to make it dance to your own tune and sparkle on the page is just clear to, to hear and see. But I mean, how did you discover this about yourself? Hey, hey, is, is how this skill and how did that translate into becoming a poet rather than something else, for example? Um, well, I think I, I was a late comer to poetry, I have to say. Um, I don't remember doing much poetry at all at primary school. And then later in the education system, the emphasis was on studying for exam purposes. And I enjoyed poetry, but I, I found it, the approach rather soulless, I suppose, really. But I think my greatest love from early on was, was words and language and languages. That was my, my great love. And I think I was quite young when I, I thought about you know, becoming a writer perhaps one day, but not a poet. Um, I did come late to poetry, as I said, you know, because I you know, spent a number of years studying German and then your focus moves away, shifts to another language. And then your mother tongue is more subsidiary in, in a sense. But how it all started, quite late, I said in my early 30s, I suddenly had a, a longing to start writing creatively. And I joined a writing workshop at the City Lit in London, where I was living at the time. Um, and it was won by the novelist and poet, Alison Fell. And I really credit her completely with bringing me, nudging me, or perhaps even launching me um, into poetry. Um, we'd had a term exploring all kinds of things like writing dialogues and descriptions and short stories. And, I always remember just before the third term, she said, we're coming on to poetry next term. And I remember thinking, oh, no, I'm not sure I really want to do that. You know, is this the point when I should leave? But I'm actually quite a stubborn person. Once I've signed up for something, you know, I just carry on. I don't give up easily. So I thought, well, at least if I try it and it's not for me, then, then I've made the effort. But she launched me into poetry. She came up with this wonderful exercise, um, which I remember so clearly to this day. Uh, called the cut up poem exercise and uh, we had to write sh three short pieces of prose not in any kind of particularly elaborate way and we were invited to cut them up into individual words and we all had to go into the classroom with our little bags of words and spread them over the table um, and it was just a wonderful energy and, and we, we were just asked to play with the words it wasn't about writing poems it was playing with words and I just had the most extraordinary session. It was like a kind of magic. And I suppose what this was, was it was a precursor of magnetic poetry, but in many ways superior because these were our own words. And we had lots of fun cutting up the words, sticking them down. So we were making poems, not writing them. And I suddenly had this, it was a moment of complete revelation. I thought, so this is what poetry is about. It's actually playing with words, having fun with words, which I've always loved. Um, all my life collecting words from different languages, different places. And, and then I, I remember after that session, I ran straight down to Foyles that was nearby and bought my first contemporary poetry book, which was the Penguin Modern Poet series. And, and that just, she launched me, I think, into poetry. Um, That's so it, interesting, Be particularly yeah. because that sort of sense of revelation is yeah. actually something that poetry does for so many people uh, of yeah. revealing a, a hidden thought or something that was lurking yeah. there that you didn't realize until yeah. you read about it it's that quality of surprise i think mm. I think surprise is important i always think that um you know you want to be able to surprise yourself in your writing in a way if you look at something and you're not surprised maybe there's some kind of energy missing and it is that quality of surprise 
And, and I, I think that's something else, actually, that yeah. you achieve really wonderfully in, in, in all your collections, actually. But, but, but specifically this sense that, um, I don't know, you managed to make the, the personal feel universal um and uh, i mean the but also and vice versa and i i feel like that within the poetry something the things that haunt us all a sense of place home belonging mm -hmm. uh, being unfettered and unmoored crops up you know uh, as themes for you and uh, you know poems such as after a spell in essex which uh, we enjoyed earlier and i just wondered how your birthplace essex and mm -hmm. then your adopted homes like northumberland and germany have actually influence your poetry I mean clearly you spoke about the that your versions of Hilda Domit and that comes from your love of the German language I assume but just informed your poetry generally this sort of sense of home and belonging I think that was Northumberland because I, I had never written a poem about place when I lived in London when I was early to poetry I was just an, an early, a novice writer then but coming up here being in Northumberland that definitely triggered a whole sort of flurry of Play, poems based in landscape, you know, and it was that surprise, the joy of all the, 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 the coastline, the ruins, the, the flora and fauna, the, the birds, the space. And, you know, my first question, there are many poems about the North and it's remained a preoccupation of mine. I'm constantly exploring the North. And so, yes, it was coming here that certainly changed everything for me in terms of writing about place. I, I felt very strongly rooted here. Um, but as for writing about Essex and Germany, again, that was later. That didn't really happen until this book. And I think that was the experience I described earlier, you know, closing down the childhood home. And that really made me think about my childhood home in a different way, perhaps because I was detached. I was no longer connected to Essex in the same way. And I felt a pull towards, you know, writing some poems about it. And, and I think with Ger it was the same with Germany. I haven't really written any poems about my time in Germany before. And I think that was that was triggered by the Hilda Domin poems. I mean, writing about writing poems and translating from another language that really took me back to that experience, which was a long time ago. It was eighty one to eighty two. So it's funny how you you have preoccupations and you keep writing, you keep exploring and lots of layers that you keep excavating, and yet there are other subjects that you haven't really touched on. And it is lovely when that happens because there is that sense of surprise. It's as if you're visiting it for the first time I think that's that's very that's really interesting and I think having read now the, the, mm. the three of your collections you can definitely see a shifting mm. in the way you deal with some of those preoccupations mm. and other things cropping up as it's very fascinating to hear that and I think often as a, a writer you know you don't always have that uh, going back and 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 mm. and looking and sort of analyzing that even though it's it's always there as a thing uh, I I think we, we actually only have 10 minutes, so we've got about two minutes left, believe it or not, of this conversation. So it's it's sad. We can't uh, delve particularly deep before we move into your next part of your reading. I did just want to briefly ask you about um, the, the sort of sense of writing. Sarah, you mentioned, or Colin mentioned in his introduction, that sense of therapeutic writing and writing for well-being. Uh, and um, I, I'm particularly struck by the blend of poignancy and humour in The Tea Lady on, on Stanbridge Ward and just touches so beautifully on so many issues that of life, love and loving care. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wondered if you could tell us just very briefly about that sort of sense of therapeutic writing in your personal writing. And obviously you facilitate workshops, too. Well, I think that poem does demonstrate my belief in the transform transformative power of writing, because I think writing about experiences like that is a way of making sense of them for a start um, and shaping them and organizing them. That's very therapeutic. Um, and I think a poem is a bit like a kind of a container or framework. And you, know, you may be in the middle of a huge and difficult and distressing experience and the poem shape acts as a kind of framework really. And it was just immensely satisfying because it's also a poem can do lots of different things at once. It's not, it's recording and preserving something that happened. But I also wanted to pay a tribute to the tea, le to the tea lady on Stanbridge Wall. And I, you know, it, it was, it was a very, it was a very therapeutic poem to write. And I think it covers all those, it brought in all those different angles, really. Um, and I, and I hope to bring that to student, to, to writers when they come to my workshops. It's that quality of exploring something that may be huge and finding a way to channel it and to bring it down onto the page. 
in a way that's satisfying and because writing is so wonderfully immersive anyway and that can well be I wish that I wish that your tea lady could read that poem I mean I don't know <laughs> if she's still around but it would be a marvelous I'm sure it is a marvelous tribute um I, I'm aware as I say yeah. that time is scooting away from us I I just quickly want to ask you I mean obviously we're we're all desperate to get out and get our copies of Unruled Journal <laughs> um but I, I, as a writer, you'll already be embarking on something new, I'm sure. So perhaps you can, you know, give us just a brief moment on what Anne did next. I'm writing about place again. I'm writing about Lisbon, where we stayed for a couple of months and we were hoping to, to live in a community there and become part of a neighbourhood. And we had to come home early last year and enforce departure for the same reason everybody else did in March 2020. Um, but I came home with poems in draft form and that has enabled me to keep close to Lisbon. And I'm now writing letters to Lisbon. It's the first time I've written letters to, to a place. And it's enabled me to hold on to Lisbon. Um, and again, I'm using language, Portuguese words, and trying to weave them into the poems. So I'm very much still in Lisbon, even though I'm, I'm currently here in Berwick still. So that's what I'm That's, that's wonderful. Uh, have yeah. poetry, will travel. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, fun. and thank you so much. I, I know that you and I could talk for hours, but uh, we mustn't. And <laughs> so I, Anna's got some more wonderful poems from Unruled Journal to read to you all. And I'd just like to remind you that Anne is happy to answer a few uh, questions at the end of her second reading. So please do put those in the Q&A mm -hmm. function and she will answer those in due course. So Anne, thank you very much for that. And I'm going to um, turn myself off and hand back over to you for your, your second reading from Unruled Journal. Thank you, Jackie. So this poem was um, inspired by a print of the first human X-ray photograph depicting the hand of Wilhelm Röntgen's wife, Anna. And Röntgen was the German physicist who discovered the X-ray. And this very unsettling view inside her own body reportedly caused her to exclaim, I have seen my death. I wanted to explore that encounter with mortality and the emotions of a, a woman who becomes her husband's experiment. The anatomy of the hand and the then very exciting new phenomenon of the x-ray started to blend with the more mythical aspect and I was also interested um, in the non-dominant hand. Now we're going to show this um, poem on the screen, it's a longer poem, and on the page, it's set out in a slightly less conventional way to suggest the strangeness of this new experience of being x-rayed. So the poem is in two parts, and it's written in the voice of Anna Berta Röntgen, and the date is 1895. One. In the dark room, somewhere beyond infrared and ultraviolet, she places her hand, between the pear-shaped tube and the plate wrapped in black paper. Her ring clinks, palm pressing against glass. The more she tries to hold still, she is tempted to escape, but she is the experiment. Should she remind him she is not a wooden or aluminium woman? His nameless rays pass through her, minute after minute, a tide of light particles. There is translucent, there is seen too much, but this lesser silent half that will never unbolt or sew, write or slice is her oldest hand and it waits, patient. Two, she sees metacarpals and phalanges that might have been carved by a cave woman. She sees her hinges. This hand, released from the troubles of skin, tissue and nerve, the vulnerable veins, is her winter hand, a bare branch reaching from shadows for secrets lower than touch, a purpose higher than waving farewell. The spare hand carries her unasked questions. Restless is not in harmony with her lips. The little black boulder, the metal of her wedding ring, has blocked the rays that loosened. This hand could scoop wind and mist, push open the sealed door in a dream, call the dead to come home. She knows her ghost hand will transgress before it scatters a miniature ruin of bones.
<clears throat> I love ruins, especially the anonymous and disregarded ruins, a ruin gently falling into itself while holding the memory of all those who lived there. And ruins, I think, are full of silences and mysteries. And the wholeness of that building is implied, and that's what draws us in. On the train from Berwick to Edinburgh, there's a tantalizing glimpse of a small ruined house at the foot of a cliff. And I thought to myself, there could be, or perhaps there should be, an occupation called ruin keeper. And if there were, I felt that would be a role that would suit my father. Uh, he was very practical and extremely meticulous. And I could just imagine him monitoring and measuring the slow collapse of the building, a sort of growth in reverse. Portrait of my father as a ruined house. The tides smooth him as they would a fragment of glass, weathering his regrets. He was unable to repair the bombed out terrace, unable to stop his wife's 40 year long falling down. With water, his neighbor now, he allows himself one weeping. Windows open to the ocean, stairs run out midair. The pink cliffs shelter him from visitors. He has assumed the post of watchman for vessels lost in the storm. Guiding star, good intent, forget me not. He overlaps his archive of papers to make a sale, a task floating him closer to happiness. A dawn riser, the ruin keeper measures fork lines in walls, sketches crumblings and cavities, listens. He's a little bowed stalk by what used to be a blue door. <clears throat> there are several poems in this book that are letters um, that are written, inverted commas, by loved ones who are no longer here. And the one I'm going to read is by my mother. And I thought I should say a little bit about how I wrote them. Basically what I did was I studied a letter, or in this case, a handful of letters, in quite a detached way, like a graphologist. And I identified words and phrases and, that were particular to that person and, and distinctive and wove some of my findings into the poem. And you may be able to guess some of these um, when you hear the poem. My mother was a very good speller, but by her own admission, she was somewhat hazy on punctuation and grammar. Uh, like many of her generation, her education had been completely disrupted by the war. I wrote this letter without commas, um, and it, that does create a slightly different tone and tempo. Particularly endearing are the errors. My mother sometimes wrote ordinary nouns with initial capital letters that weren't strictly correct. And one of the phrases in her letters was carers, hoists and wheelchairs. And suddenly it became inadvertently like a, like a title for her life. Um, she suffered from muscular dystrophy, which is a progressive wasting of the muscles in arms and legs. And in her case, spanning over 40 years. And I imagined that if my mother were to write to me now, what would she say? So this is my mother writing to me. And we're going to show this poem on the screen so that you can see some of the language characteristics that I've, that I've mentioned. <clears throat> my mother writes a letter. I was unsure about full stops, panic struck by exclamation marks. Sorry, I was always in a hurry to reach the kisses. And I wrote some things twice but could not cross them out. My life should have been called carers, hoists and wheelchairs. No room for fancy touches. Thank you for scattering my adjectives like ashes. I was tired of kind and nice. Did you remember grateful? Your book from the borders is a little elaborate for me. Patterns I can't manage, but never mind. An authoress should sometimes censor the I, otherwise she might turn blobby and run out early. Expect you will find errors in this, will not score 10 out of 10 for my grammar, though I worry about those who do, because there are troubles for a girl who has words written on her skirt 
Hope you are not working too hard. I taught you to follow the please and thank you lines. Then you started colouring yourself in. You swerved into blue and violet. And I prefer lilac, but never mind. When you wrapped my hand round a pen and I tried to smoke the pen, we laughed. And there was nothing left to hold, only love, which is a country. Must close now, dear. I think this is getting a bit far-fetched, but never mind. And this is now the last poem I'm going to read. A few years ago, um, on a whim, I joined the Walk Jog programme, won by Tweed Striders, the local running club in Berwick. And this is where you build up running ability from scratch over 10 weeks. I'm definitely no athlete. I, I loathed and dreaded cross-country running at school. And for about 40 years, my only running was the occasional sprint for a train. But thanks to the efforts of the inspirational head coach, Caroline McDermott, another unsung community heroine, I was converted. But running for me is not about winning or speed or distance. I mean, it's too late for me to be ambitious. And I think that's quite liberating. I'm constantly being overtaken, but I have to say the striders, they do sail past very graciously and they often call out things like well done. And I just love the camaraderie of running together in, in all weathers. There are the obvious mental, physical, emotional, social benefits, but perhaps the simplest and strongest reason for running for me um, is that I am able to. Uh, I think of my mother on, on every run. My favourite solo run is the early morning run that I do along the Tweed. And somehow running, I, I feel I inhabit the landscape in, in a different way. There's a reference in the poem to a piece of music called Melancholy, and it's by Baltavara, the Finnish composer. Running, I become. Three bridges over the old red sandstone bridge, under the concrete bridge, speeding up to reach the arches of the Royal Border Bridge. The piers above me, an open air cathedral. I become a woman running with water and mudflats, with North Sea and estuary, drawing towards the river's source. Running minus earphones, I become music, passing through melancholy, where the shore larks warbling slows down. I become November, gloveless hands, face chilling to painless, oil of clove dissolving. Running, I become the woman with 10 meter legs, with a pinhead, content so scanty, it no longer needs to survey the horizon for obstructions. I become significant to dogs who bark to run with me, whose owners now address me. Did you just pass a man with a big black dog? No breath to explain that her three ankle hungry Jack Russells worry me more than one giant lollopy dog. Running, redrafting myself, I return to my primal language of sigh and puff and laugh. I become sweat and tear, the low thud song of my lungs. Running, I become a woman wintering. I follow the pink footed geese crossing the hard blue sky in a great wavering W. And when it sharpens to a V, a letter of purpose. I join the formation of those who know where to go and how and why, gliding upstream in their upwash, their wing beat. Running, I become the border. Thank you for listening. Over to you again, Jackie, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. That was absolutely lo lovely to, to listen to those poems, which are, are so evocative mm. and joyful. Mm. And uh, it, it just really is a privilege and uh, exciting to be celebrating uh, the, your sort of pre-publication day. Now, we have got a few questions mm. and uh, you've very kindly said you'll answer those. Mm. So uh, first off, actually, it's a subject we did touch on in our conversation um, but uh, it's from John uh, and uh, he says uh, south of England, Germany, Berwick, Lagan. Um, mm. Could you say a little bit about this importance of place in your poetry? As I say we have touched on that but. Mm. Um, well as I said it's becoming much more important 
um, I do feel very drawn to place. And it's a way of maybe rediscovering a place that you thought you knew. Um, and of course, there are always more places to discover, really, um, and new insights. I mean, one of the insights I had one of the poems in the, the collection was that I started to think that maybe even our parents' homes become our home and that we could explore them as places. Um, I made a trip up to Abadal, where my mother spent the first three years of her life and had this feeling that being a homecoming. So, and I think, I think, yes, I think the attraction to place is essentially the question of, well, what is home? Where is home? And of course, we all have many homes and there are many interpretations. Is it where we're born, where we grow up, where we live now in a, perhaps an adopted county, um, where we travel, where we stay for a while? We all have um, countries that we sort of hold with us and take with us. And I think it is connected to home. But yes, one of the things I realised was that a place you've never been to before can become a home simply because it was the home perhaps of one of your parents. So I don't know if it's that answers the question, but it, it is to do with home, I think, yes. Well, I was just thinking that actually that's also complicated by the way other people perceive you. And mm -hmm. I think that comes across both in some of your sort of personal story poetry, but also, you know, in for a displaced person, you know, mm. what is home? Uh, uh, and it's also about how other people perceive you, refugee, uh, displaced person. So, mm. yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Collins just sent a message to everyone uh, saying, do do keep your, your questions coming. Um, and a question here from Leslie. Uh, they say, I'm very much enjoying listening to your poems in your own voice, interwoven with your life stories. It's, uh, Great. Uh, I was interested in your early experience of cutting and pasting actual words in a creative writing course. Um, and Leslie says, uh, I've got a set of magnetic words and part words which stick to uh, the microwave and uh, sometimes move them around and leave them in a new arrangement. And do, I know you, you alluded to magnetic words, Anne, but do you actually have them? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, do you still write poetry in that way? Do you ever use that as a way in? Occasionally, if I feel that I'm sort of becoming less surprised with my own poems, if I've written a poem that I feel is meaningful, but I don't feel surprised by it, one thing that you could do is, is to cut it up and play it and play around. And sometimes new, new directions suggest themselves really in a way. Um, so, but, but the other problem, of course, with this cutting up words is it's, it's seriously addictive. Um, and in the past, when I, when I have done it, I found myself spending weeks with words all over different tables and different parts of the house. But it, it's, it's a huge amount of fun. But no, I haven't, I haven't done it for a while. But I think it's a wonderful thing. It's something I would recommend to people come to workshops. Because people often say to me, you know, I want to write, I'm longing to write, but I'm not writing. And this will be a wonderful way to, to, to get started. Because you're not sitting there consciously writing poetry. You are basically having adventures with words. And what a lovely way of looking at it. And Adventures with words. Next time you're cooking, Leslie, and you're moving those things around, your magnetic words, remember you're having adventures with words. <laughs> I would suggest to Leslie that she tries using some of her own words and cutting them up. And you might be astonished um, what actually comes out of it. And I do remember this workshop I went to years ago, the one I just talked about. I can still remember some of the lines that people came up with and they were extraordinary. And we were all astonished. We were, we were looking at something, at what we'd uh, stuck on the, the piece of paper, all the words cut up and the glue and everything, and looking at them and thinking, did I write that? But they were our words. So, I, yes, I think one can progress from magnetic poetry to, <laughs> to one's own words. Um, and that would be a wonderful and surprising thing to do, I think. There we go. We've all had a sneak preview of a workshop with Anne. And obviously you will be running a, a workshop at the Literary Festival, which is something to look forward to. Yeah. Now, Chris says, mm. Anne, you mentioned the singing women of Duddo Stones. Mm. Do you sometimes think of yourself as a singing stone in the landscape? There's something so, <laughs> there is something so elemental and natural in the way you write uh, or sing about yourself running. Mm. I can't honestly say I've ever had that thought, but it's certainly an interesting proposition. To, it certainly conjures up something in the imagination. Perhaps, I mean, there is another poem in the book called this, uh, this, The Singing Moon of Dado, about the singing moon of Dado. And I did imagine them as being a group of women um, that maybe I tried to join. And again, that's about belonging. And I imagined myself up there, and I had been up in the landscape, obviously just spending time whiling away a few hours up there and imagining if that was a group 
would I want to join this group? But I can't honestly say I've ever thought of myself as a singing woman or a stone woman. But it, it, yes, there's certainly a, a poem where I've kind of explored that idea of, of, of joining that, that group of stones. Um, but what are they? Are they a, a group of, are they a reading group? Are they, you know, what, what are they? What, what, are, what is their purpose up there? Do, do they, what do they talk about when we're, we're not there? <laughs> so so I, could, I could allow my imagination to, to roam on that one, I think. <laughs> I can imagine uh, yes and uh, you, you you often take quite very quirky avenues with uh, with that imagination so it's a, it's a good one now Meg says as a follow-on from the question on place uh, you you often use this is a dialect kind of question really you often use other vernaculars and indeed languages and are there aspects of language in your poems that reflect your Essex background um perhaps more the East End origins of my father and that's why I enjoyed the, the tea lady poem. Um, and in, in my second book, I had a, a large sequence of poems in, in the middle um, written in the imagined voices of my ancestors. So there were quite a few sort of East End accents there. But I mean, in fact, as I said, my father's family was originally from the East End and, and I grew up in Essex, but um, and where the, I suppose any accent or, or dialect, if you like, is very, is very similar to, 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 to London, to the London accents. Um, so probably a bit less about that, but maybe who knows, that's something I may well still explore, you know, so, but I do enjoy, I do enjoy, and I, well, I love using dialects, I think it's a way of celebrating a particular community, really, and it does, it adds texture to a poem, and it can root a poem in a particular landscape, so it's a lot of fun to use dialect, but I, I think perhaps most of all, I've had fun with the dialect here, because when I came here, there were so many words I didn't know. And again, you so see, that's the surprise, the discovery of, of learning new words. And my students at the community centre, they taught me most, most of the words I have in this book. I learned those from my students. So that was wonderful. And that's, that's a great thing, I, I guess, about running the workshops as you do. It is, I mean, teaching is always a two-way process. And as you say, they're on, on that sort of level, but often on an inspiration yeah. level too, which yeah, is... It uh, very much is. I mean, I, I love running workshops and um, people just bring, whether they're beginner writers or more experienced writers, they just bring incredible experience and expertise. I mean, I always, I always learn a lot from my own workshops, not from, my, <laughs> from listening to the other people who are, who are present. So that's, it's a joy, and I think it's a privilege to have a group of people who've come along to write poetry, basically, so. Well, it's been a joy and a privilege to yeah. listen to you reading from Unruled Journal uh, this evening. And uh, it's, I'm just sorry you can't see everybody, but as you say, you have seen all of the names of the people who are here, who've joined us to mm -hmm. celebrate and look forward uh, to this this wonderful uh, new collection, which uh, I hope everyone will rush out to to uh, buy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, first of all, though, before I give you details about buying that, I just want to, on behalf of us all here this evening, just thank you, Anne, uh, for just sharing your work and yourself, honestly, so vividly and so personally. It, it, it is. It has been completely compelling, so thank you. And um, so here is the new collection. And I know that Anne uh, just wants to say a few more, uh, just a few more words before she signs off. And then I'll, I'll just take up for a brief moment to tell you about buying it. Anne. Well, thank you, Jackie. Yes, well, I'd just like to thank you all so much for coming along um, this evening, for listening, I hope you've enjoyed the reading. I've thoroughly enjoyed sharing my poems with you. Um, it's, it's, it's a privilege, I think, to be reading to such, a, such an audience. Um, and it's, it's been absolutely wonderful and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you all very much. And thank you again to everybody on the team at the Literary Festival as well. So many thanks. Goodbye. Thank you again, Anne. And uh, so Unruled Journal is published by Valley Press and it's available to buy through them as well as through all good bookshops, including uh, Greaves here in Berwick. So you will be able to get your copy here locally and uh, as I say, through Valley Press. Now, I'm going to hand over to uh, Michael Gallico, who's the chair of the Literary Festival Steering Group. Uh, Michael. Well, thank you, Jackie, and good evening to everybody. Um, I'm delighted that such a large number of friends and family and 
patrons of the festival have joined us this evening. Um, I think I've noticed that we've someone from South Africa here. Uh, Colin was talking about how far this has reached, but that's something really special. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed the evening. I certainly have myself. Um, there's a lot of thanks here. So I'd like to thank Anne for giving us the opportunity to have this. This is the first book launch I think the festival has, has run. It's a special moment uh, in any author's life. So many congratulations, Anne. I know tomorrow is the official launch, um, but I hope that you don't think you've um, preempted it tonight. Um, so thank you for doing this. And thank you to Jackie and Colin who've led us tonight and Kevin Butler who's behind the scenes because there's always someone behind the scenes on a festival mm -hmm. Zoom talk. Um, I don't want to say a great deal tonight. If you're new to the festival, um, I can only urge you to go and visit our website uh, and learn some more. Um, we're an almost entirely volunteer run festival. And last year, when other festivals ran for cover, shall we say, um, we persevered and we were a really well received event on Zoom. Uh, and in a fortnight's time, we will be deep in our next program. Now, I'm not going to tell you, you know, names and highlights because one person's highlight is someone's low light. And there's a huge range of speakers um, from the globally famous to the quirky. Um, and please just go online and see what we have. The festival is free to all. Uh, it's on Zoom and uh, we're looking forward to it. Um, to those who are not patrons tonight here, I'd like to do a little bit of an advertisement. If you would like to support the festival, we have a patron scheme here. We would love to have more um, because it's a wonderful thing and it really encourages you know, the team of a dozen of us who put this festival together to have that kind of support in the town and increasingly you know, from beyond. Um, and I dare say, uh, here I'm going to rattle the bucket now, uh, there is a donation site a donation page uh, on our website. Um, to the existing patrons, I'll simply say thank you for your support. And I hope you've enjoyed you know, this. I, I'm not sure if it's the fifth or the sixth patrons event we've had this year, uh, but it's you know, the variety is wonderful. Um, don't forget to book your sessions. Uh, it's only two weeks away. And if you're in Berwick, there's a plug, because we're always doing something new here. You know, this festival doesn't stand still. Um, my job is to try and sort of keep on top of these charging horses of enthusiasts on the steering wheel. And make sure we all go in the same direction because they are constantly full of good ideas. And the latest one that we've just put out today, and I think Jackie's written a blog you know, that's on our website, um, is our Books by the Sea Library. So if you go down Pier Road and go into the Little Beach car park, I think you'll get a pleasant surprise. So chat will be open now uh, for the next 10 or 15 minutes. And to everyone, all I need to say again is thank you, Anne, and congratulations. If we'd been in the Guildhall, we would have done this. And so let's hope everyone can raise it for us to Anne. And I just say good night and thank you. <laughs>